This video will cover the proper use of a burette. Look elsewhere for specific information about the chemistry of your particular type of titration experiment. Before you begin, ensure that your burette is clean. Rinse the inside with some deionized water. The water should sheet down the side of the glass evenly. If the glass holds droplets of water as shown here, then clean the burette with detergent and water. Use the long-handled brushes that extend the full length of the burette. Put some detergent and water on the brush and scrub the inside. Rinse the burette thoroughly, first with tap water and then with deionized water. Use a beaker to pour into the top of the burette rather than trying to hold the opening of the burette under the faucet. Attach a burette clamp firmly to the stand and lock the burette into place. In this demonstration, we will be using sodium hydroxide to titrate a solution of acetic acid using phenolphthalein as a color indicator of the endpoint of the titration. Be sure that the stopcock is closed and then pour the titrant solution slowly into the open end. Rinse the burette with five to 10 milliliter portions two or three more times. Rotate the burette slowly as you pour the liquid out into a waste beaker. Now refill the burette for the titration. Place a beaker for catching waste solution below the burette tip. Use several quick twists of the stopcock valve to introduce liquid into the bottom of the burette and coax any bubbles out of the tip. If necessary, bring the liquid level back near the top. You don't have to start exactly at the zero mark. The meniscus must, however, begin somewhere below the line associated with zero. If you've used a funnel to pour into the burette, then remove it now so it does not drip into the burette after you've started your titration. That would lead to an error. You may also want to add a dust cap. Estimate where the bottom of the meniscus is on the graduated scale. You may find it helpful to use a reading card. A reading card is merely a colored rectangle on a white background. By bringing the rectangle up just below the meniscus, colored light is reflected off the curved surface to give a distinct outline against the white background. If you use this method, be careful about keeping the rectangle at a consistent distance from the bottom of the meniscus each time you read. The meniscus may appear to move as the rectangle moves. Equally important is positioning your eye so that it is at this, in the same plane as the tangent drawn to the bottom of the meniscus. Here the position of the meniscus is between the zero and the one milliliter mark. The shorter lines that do not go all the way around the burette are associated with intervals of 0.1 milliliter. In this case, the meniscus appears to be between the seventh and the eighth marks, so its position is at least 0.7 milliliters. We can estimate the fraction of the gap between the nearest lines spanned by the bottom of the meniscus. Here it appears to be a little bit less than halfway, perhaps 40% of the interval. In that case, we estimate the position of this meniscus at the start of this titration to be about 0.74 milliliters. This last digit is a guess, but with a little practice, you can learn to be very consistent and obtain reproducible and accurate data to the nearest hundredth of a milliliter. That should be your goal in your work today. Be sure to record your initial reading in each of your titrations. We're ready now to transfer the sample to our titration flask. In this demonstration, we are using acetic acid as a sample. We count the number of drops of indicator that are added so that our results will be as consistent as possible from run to run. We place the titration flask under the burette point so that the burette is slightly below the rim of the flask. This minimizes the chance for losing an errant drop. We begin adding titrant. If we have a good idea roughly where the end of the titration will occur, then we can save some time by running the titrant into the flask to within a milliliter or two of the expected endpoint. It is common practice to run multiple trials with portions of the same sample. So it is good strategy to run one trial very quickly, merely to find out where the approximate endpoint is. 
The next few trials can be done carefully from a point very close to the end. The first trial does not need to be averaged with the more carefully obtained data. Close to the end point, the color disperses more gradually. Here is a technique for capturing the color change to within a fraction of a drop of the end point. Open the stopcock very slowly only part way. Allow a droplet to grow about half its full size. Then use the wash bottle to rinse the drop down into the reaction flask. Adding small amounts of water does not change the appearance of the end point. The true end point is, in this case, the first faint color that remains after 15 seconds of stirring. Finally, carefully read the ending volume and record it to the nearest hundredth of a milliliter in your laboratory notebook.